I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Etiwana Gardens. Give them a shout out. Ready to go out there, guys. So proud of you guys. Uh, Lone Hill's actually meeting down at Sunrise right now during the summer, so give a shout out to our friends down at Lone Hill. And online campus, great to have you with us down in Australia, New Zealand. Thanks for watching. Glad that you're part of us. I want to remind you again, as I've said numerous times lately, because sometimes we forget that this is our only little audience, but we are one church, many locations, and many services, and uh, we are part of a larger group. Uh, we're in a series right now, we, we've called it We Are CCV. And what we're doing, uh, let me remind you, is this is not a statement of faith series where we're trying to outline our statement of faith. We are an evangelical church. We believe the Bible is the absolute authority. It is God's word. We live our lives. And when our lives do not conform well with Scripture, it's not the Scripture that changes, it's us. And we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the way to salvation because of his all-sufficient, all-atoning sacrifice on the cross. It puts us in a right relationship with God the Father. And if you want to know more about what we believe, you can check us out on our website. This is not a Statement of Faith series. This is a core value series. This is to let us know who we are. If we're asking you to drop anchor and be part of this church, then we want you to know what it is you're dropping anchor into. There are certain things that motivate us. Now, the mission of the church never really changes, does it? Jesus gave us that mission. And we are setting about with our greatest energies and the first fruits of our lives to go out and accomplish the mission that Jesus gave us. The strategy to achieve that mission sometimes has to adapt to each generation. And the church has done a good job of that over the centuries. We're still trying to do that now. And so the core values of our church are represented in seven basic statements that we want you to understand. And we want when people pass you on the highway and you've got a CCV bumper sticker, we want it to be so well known what we stand for that they'll look at you and say, man, that's a CCV or this is what makes them tick. This is what makes their heart beat a little faster. This is what makes the blood course through their veins at a little bit more rapid pace. And so we started last week. With core value number one, and I want us to repeat it together again. Here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus is our only hope, and we are his plan to reach those far from God. One life at a time, there is no plan B. Let's do that again at Etiwanda, at the sunrise, all together now. One, two, three. Jesus is our only hope, and we are his plan to reach those far from God. One life at a time, there is no plan B. In our mind, we can't imagine what it would be like to be a church that has no passion for those far from God. The thing Jesus said before his ascension was go into all the world, teach them everything I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you even to the very end of the age. And in Acts chapter 1, he told the apostles to wait on the mountain, and he said, you're going to be my witnesses. In, in the entire world, starting with Judea, Samaria, the rest of the, the ends of the earth, you're going to go out and be my witnesses. And we believe that, man, if you're going to be the church of Jesus Christ, you've got to have a passion, not only to grow in your own faith, but to go out and help those who are far from God come near to God. That makes our heart beat fast, and we're going to do whatever it takes, short of sin, to make sure we reach the next generation and this generation with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, here's our second core value. I want to state it. I'm going to ask you to repeat it, then I'll give an explanation just quickly. Here we go. It's big faith. We are not here to maintain, but to take new ground. We honor the past while being faithful to what God is calling us to do in the future. Let me say it again. We are not here to maintain, but to take new ground. We honor the past while being faithful to what God is calling us to do in the future. Now, I want us all to repeat that together. We are people of big faith on the count of three on all campuses, Etiwanda, Lone Hill, wherever you are, Sunrise, even in Australia, New Zealand, it's good for you. One, two, three. We are not here to maintain, but to take new ground. We honor the past while being faithful to what God is calling us to do in the future. Now, what that means is we are going to honor the past. And we feel like there's no way we can know where God wants us to go in the future unless we know how he's been setting us up in the past. And what you're going to discover is that there have been three primary senior pastors, senior leaders at this church over the last 30, 40 years. Ron Keller, Chuck Boer, and now me. And we are all very similar people with a similar passion. Now, what we're going to do this weekend, I think I've been wanting to do this for a long, long time, and I'm finally glad we had an opportunity to do this. But Ron Keller... It, Ron Keller and his ministry is 
A primary reason you and I are able to be here now, I've said from the time I got here, I walked into a situation where I was a great benefactor of the hard yards and hard work and hard ministry and the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of Ron Keller. Uh, it is Ron's vision that took a little church at Lark Ellen and got it to this point right here. We meet in this facility because there are people gone before us that sacrifice greatly so that we might be able to be here. And Ron Keller was the leader uh, of that movement. And so I know as a young pastor uh, that I, that's getting older now that uh, we are beneficiaries of a man who has, gived, who has lived and given his life for the cause of Christ. So I want you to put your hands together and welcome out the founding pastor, really, of CCV, Ron Keller. Uh, Ron, Ron and I got to spend a couple hours together on Thursday down at, uh, down at the Brea Mall, and I wish I could have had a lot more time because the stories, the, the information that Ron has is, is quite remarkable. He, uh, and I, I, I've, I've made it very clear to our staff that uh, we are so blessed to be able to come in uh, to a church where two pastors worked so hard uh, to motivate people to reach those who were far from God. As a matter of fact, I want you to know that when I first took this job here, this guy took me out for lunch. And he said, I want you to know, Jeff, I am for you, and I believe you're God's man for this job. And what that meant to me to get the approval of the guy who had done so much hard work to get this church to where it is just meant so much to me. And I am, I'm grateful. So Ron, thank you for that, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for this opportunity. This has been wonderful, and I'm going to enjoy it, and I hope the people do as well. Oh, I'm sure they will. Okay. We'll Any see. break from me is an enjoyable oh, weekend. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ron, you know, there's so much into the story, but, uh, you know, it wasn't easy going. You shared with us uh, last night. It wasn't easy going for much of your ministry, but you weathered the storm because you felt like the call of God was on your life to be the pastor of, uh, of CCV, what was then uh, Covina Church of Christ. Walk us through two things quickly. One, tell us how you became the pastor. And two, tell us, uh, tell us when, you, when you became the pastor the second time, what moves you started making that now we're all reaping the benefits of. Well, the first time I came was in 1966. And uh, I had actually uh, received a call from the church uh, to uh, come here as the pastor because the pastor who had, uh, was before me had gotten into trouble, and he left a note on the <laughs> uh, secretary's desk, I'm out of here, uh, go going to Chicago, and he never saw his family again. The church was only running about 150 people at that time, and I had grown up in the youth group of this church, so I'd been around since I was 10 years of age. And so anyway, the church calls me to come at uh, 1966. I was 25 years old at the time. And so the uh, auditorium at that time was on the corner of Lark Ellen and Pueni. We had 154 seats. And the first Sunday there, we had 150 in attendance. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. But every Sunday after that, the attendance got less and less and less. And I'm feeling pretty depressed because I'm supposed to be building the church, not killing the church. <laughs> and so uh, here's what happened. There was uh, the elder's wife, one of the elder's wife was one of the church gossipers. And uh, she always would speak with her mouth like this. And her husband was the chairman of the elders. And so I, I, I confronted her one time. I said, you know, uh, you don't have a very good reputation here. Um, you're you're kind of looked upon as the church gossip. Well, she got a little upset at me, and she left the church. And her husband left the church a couple of months later. Now the church is down to 115 people. And I am pretty discouraged. Huh. But what happened was this. Once that family left the church, God started blessing the ministry. Hmm. You know, one influential family in a church, especially a small congregation, can destroy a church. Hmm. And once that family left, God started blessing this church. And it started growing, and we filled it up. In fact, we had so many people coming that we had to open the windows, open the side doors. We had chairs outside. We had chairs out on the patio. 
And it was now time to have a second service. And this is what I think Jeff really wants me to talk about. It was called Celebration. Some of the people who are here still today were part of that celebration service. After we filled up the first service and we were ready for the second service, some young people had just got back from camp and they came to me and they said, Ron, I hear you're going to start a second service. Could we have some input in that service? And uh, I said, well, what do, you, what do you want to do? Well, we want to get rid of the organ. We want to get rid of the piano. We want to get rid of the robed choir. We want you to sit down when you speak. We want to use guitars and bongo drums. We want to have a roving mic going through the auditorium. We want to sing Kumbaya, my Lord, and do Lord, oh do Lord, do remember me. We want to sing camp songs, but we want people to have an opportunity of praying or sharing how God has blessed them during the week, that sort of thing. And so uh, I thought about this, and I said, woo, you know, that's, that's a big asking. But I wanted to step out in faith. I wanted to listen to those young people. I know what Jeff wants to do. He wants to reach the next generation. The only way you're going to reach the next generation is to listen to what the next generation wants. And of course, there were people in the church, oh, you're just catering to the young people. Well, listen, you've had your time. We've got to reach the next generation. And so the elders approved this. They stepped out in big faith. And so now the Sunday is coming when we're going to have this celebration service, and I'm a little nervous about it. Well, the first service was typical, you know, the robe choir and the organ and the piano and, and the, you know, just the waving of the arm by the worship leader and, this, uh, you know, not a very big crowd there. But the second service was so full, we couldn't contain the people that were there. A lot of people from first service wanted to see what second service was all about. <laughs> well, that service grew so much that if you came late to church, you sat in the choir loft. If you came late to church, you sat on the floor of the uh, platform around me. I had to be careful when I was preaching lest I stepped on somebody because they were sitting all around me on the floor. And so now we were going to move to Fox Theater, which was located on Azusa Avenue, 800-seat theater. And there we uh, moved that particular service. We filled up that theater. And that was one of the most exciting times in my ministry. But we reached the next generation by listening to the next generation, in spite of the fact that there were people who were complaining about it. But we couldn't allow their complaints to bother us we had to do what we believe God was calling us to do. The, the church will survive as long as you have people who are young enough to live through that church. In other words, if you have a bunch of gray heads in the church, you can count the years, the number of years that church has left to live. But if you have a lot of teenagers in the church, well, that church has got a good future. And that's what I believed, and that's what happened the first time. One of the disappointing things with me during that time is we were looking for property, just like, just like you're trying to look for property. Yeah. And we had 15 acres on the freeway. And the, the, the price of this land was $1.5 million, 15 acres right down from Forest Lawn Cemetery. And we claimed that property. But we had a group of elders at that time. And I'm going to have to take blame too. We didn't have the faith to step out, and we dilly-dallied around. And Lauren Green from Bonanza, you might remember the old Bonanza show, movie star, he came in and purchased that property. And this church missed out on the biggest opportunity that it's ever missed by missing out on buying that 15 acres along the 10 freeway. And I was so discouraged by this that in 1980, I left and went to another ministry. So this was your, your first time, your first stint as the pastor there. And then you told us last night how you had grown up in this uh, church. Really, you've been there almost from day one. Yeah. So they called you the first time. When you came the first time, one of the things you did that first time is say, we've got to reach this next generation. How did, how, you, Dane told me something last night I thought was interesting. You came out to your people and you told them, he remembers three statements. Now, Dane probably doesn't remember what I say from week to week, but he remembers yeah. something you said 30, right. 40 years ago. Right. You, said, you said to the people, we are going to change here. We are going to stand up, look up, 
and praise up. Now we're going to sing up and lift up. Sing up, well, okay, yeah, he, that's his fault, was, that's his fault. He, uh, those are the words he I gave me. This was actually, this was actually the second time, because in 19, this was the second time back, and this is in 1988. I was called, I was, uh, had a ministry in Tucson. So, Ron, t- tell us, oh. why did the, 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 everything was going well that first time you were senior pastor. Yeah. Why, did you, why did you go? I left because we couldn't get property, and I was discouraged by the fact that we, we, we couldn't relocate. We just, everything was, uh, uh, the elders did not step out in faith, and I didn't step out in faith mm-hmm. and say, we need to purchase this property in spite of the fact that we couldn't rub two nickels together mm-hmm. because we had a difficult time even meeting budget. So you're, you're, it's amazing how similar we are in yeah. that because it's tough for our personality types just to maintain. Yeah. We want to go forward. So we want to go forward. I felt like I had done all I could do and it's time, and I'd been here since I was 10 years of age, and now I'm 40 years of age, so I was 30 years in this church, and now it's time to, hey, look someplace else. What, what brought you back the second time? Okay, well, I'm in Tucson, Arizona. I just went there. Um, I've been there about six months, and there was a real problem that had developed in this church with the pastor who succeeded me, or who preceded me, I should say. Um, and I don't want to go into uh, all the problems that there were, but the church was an angry church. And I, in fact, half the congregation had left. All the elders of the church had resigned. All the staff of the church had left except for the music minister, Dave Reynolds. He was the only one around. And the church was being run by the elders of Eastside Christian Church in Fullerton, where a man by the name of Ben Merrill was the pastor. And he told me, he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give this church to a dog. He said, I, I can't recommend you going there at all. He said, if you go to this church, you're not going to last a year. Well, I'd been to this church before, and I knew a lot of people in the church, and I knew the people that he was talking about. Uh, that simply wasn't true. So when I came the second time, I, I came because no one else would take the job. Hmm. And I felt like, I've already put in a lot of time in this church, and I'm not going to let this church die. So I left a ministry that I was enjoying a great deal in Tucson to come here, and the church was dead. No young people at all. Uh, And so the first thing I wanted to do was to, I wanted to get the people to worship. And so I did a series of sermons on worship. And that's where this theme came in. We're going to stand up. We're going to look up, we're going to sing up, and we're going to lift up. Now, what do I mean? We're going to stand up. We are singing to God, and the Lord inhabits the praises of His people, and we are going to stand out of respect for God. Then I said, we're going to look up. We're not going to have our nose in a hymn book. We're going to look up, and we're going to sing up. Remember, the Bible says the Lord uh, will will accept a joyful noise. Mm. And you may only have a joyful noise, but I want to hear a noise. And I want that noise to be joyful. And we're going to lift up. When it comes time to praise and you feel like it, lift your hands up to the Lord. That's what we were teaching the people. Now, in 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 the meantime, I wanted to get youth in this church because the church had no energy. And I'm used to seeing a lot of young people around. We didn't have any young people. The man I wanted to get here was Chuck Boer. I met Chuck in Tucson. He had a church there in Tucson, even as I had a church in Tucson. And he was having problems with the elders of the church. And so he and I were meeting on a monthly basis when I was there in Tucson, kind of mentoring him through these problems. And so when I accepted the call to come here to this church, I asked him to come. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. So I got here. And uh, I still wanted the top youth man that I could find, and I believed that Chuck was the man for the job. So I gave him a call on the phone. I said, Chuck, uh, are you ready to come? No. Uh, Another uh, few weeks went by, and I called him another time, and I said, Chuck, are you ready to come? He said, no. Well, now I'm kind of uh, wondering, who am I going to hire? Because I want to reach the next generation. I want some energy in this church. I want some young people running around this church. So I asked my wife, 
And I said, uh, I, I don't know what to do. And she said, who do you want? I said, I want Chuck Boer. And she said, call him. I said, I've already talked with him three times, and he said no. She says, call him. He's going to accept. Now, my wife is very, very intuitive. So I gave a call to Chuck again. Well, Pam had just come out. It was his wife. Pam came home from work, and she had a run-in with the boss. Chuck just came back from an elders meeting, and he had problems with the elders. I caught him exactly at the right time <laughs> because I had a wife that was in tune with the Lord, and so Chuck agreed to come. And he came about six months after I started the ministry here. And the whole thing that we wanted to do was reach the next generation. Now, we're changing the worship service a little bit. And the way by which we did that, because I know, I know there are people that are not happy with not having their hymns uh, or their traditional kind of service. So I met with anybody who wanted to meet with me. I called a meeting of, uh, of some of the uh, elderly people in the church and said, hey, you've had it your way. Now, why don't you let us reach this next generation. And we'll start a service on Thursday morning. You're all retired. You can come to church on Thursday morning. You can sing all the hymns you want to sing. I love hymns. I don't have anything against hymns. But they wanted to sing hymns, fine. We were not going to reach the next generation with the kind of worship service that we had. And I let them know that. I said, you don't want this church to die, do you? No, we want this church to go. Okay, well, you come on Thursday. We'll have your hymns. We'll have different preaching on there. I think you'll enjoy it. And I got all of those people behind me. And so the church worship changed. We put the words up on the screen. We had a band. We sang the praise songs, a lot of Hosanna music, vineyard music, and so forth. And uh, so the worship service now is really picking up. There's energy in the worship service. People are really understanding what it means to worship. But what did Chuck do to get the young people here? We sat down and had a little plan on this. We believe that if you reach the influential people, you're going to reach the least or the less influential people. And so we want to reach the high school kids. So who's the most influential people on campus? Well, it's the quarterback of the football team or it's the cheerleaders. So we said, why don't you go out, because Pam is involved in photography, why don't you go out and video the football games? And video particularly focus on the quarterback, focus on the cheerleaders. And so uh, they went to various high schools during their games. And so the kids would say, who are those people over there uh, videoing us? Well, that's the youth pastor of what was now Christ Church of the Valley. And then, if you want to see yourself on screen, you got to come to church on Thursday. Well, everybody wants to see themselves, okay? So they came. And we just packed this building out on Thursday night. I mean, it was a phenomenal experience. And, and what we did, we taught the Word of God to those people. Sunday morning, it was expository preaching. Thursday night, it was expository preaching, going right through the Bible, verse by verse. And those young people came with their Bibles. They came with their pens. They took notes during the sermon, and they were praising God. And then they would line up. This is one of the thrilling thing. We'd have a prayer time with these young people. They'd line up to pray over the microphone, and they would begin their prayer. Dear Daddy God. Some people thought that was disrespectful to call God Daddy. But you know, many of those young people didn't have a dad. Mm. Mm. And so it was, it was such an experience to see them refer to God in such an intimate way. Mm. Dear Daddy God, Abba, Father. But it took faith mm. to do this, mm. to step out and see what God would do in this case. And so it was a phenomenal ministry. And all, a lot of that began at that Lark Allen property because a new building was built during the time in which I was absent on the other side of the street. Now, I imagine you want to know how we got here. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, did, how did you get here? Okay. I'm well, glad you asked that question. Yeah, well. <laughs> when you, uh, before you say that, Ron, did you, did you, when you changed uh, and started going after the next generation, that would have been 70s, 80s? 
Now that was an 88, well, the, 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 I came here in 88 the second time, and so uh, that's when Chuck came, it was in 1988, so we started what I just talked about in, yeah. uh, in 1988, yeah. Did you bring, did you bring drums in? Well, yes. How did people respond to the drums? Oh, well, we did have some complaints. <laughs> so Chuck, through this youth ministry, just begins to explode. And uh, I'm assuming then you, you realize you're going to have to move again. Tell us the story of how you moved from there then to here. Yeah. I, I want to just say one other sure. thing and then I'll do that. Because this, this was the philosophy that Chuck and I came up with. It was this. If I could reach the young person. Remember, the church is having a difficult time financially. I mean, we're not we're, we're putting a lot of money away. You don't get money from young people. Mm. They're not going to put anything in the offering plate. And so it was a gamble to try to reach the youth. But here was the thinking I had. If I could reach the teenager and change the teenager's life, the mom and dad would say, what has happened to you? Yeah. And so the mom and dad then are going to come to church to find out what's going on. Yeah. Maybe their kid is in a cult. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. There were every Sunday we had kids, teenagers, baptizing their mother and dad in that baptistry over there. And that's how this church grew, where we had to relocate. Now, we want to come to that point. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we need to move. Now, we're going back to 1992. In 1992, I looked over this piece of property. It was actually initially owned by the in and out people, the Schneider family, and the house you have there on the corner where the offices have been. Uh, that was where the, the Schneiders lived that, that started in and out hamburgers. Uh, but the property had actually been purchased by a diamond bar at uh, Calvary Chapel where Raul Reese preaches. And he tried to build a church on this property, and the city of San Dimas wouldn't let him do it. And so in 1992, I uh, talked with uh, the people over at Calvary Chapel Diamond Bar, and I said, we'd, we'd like to buy the property. Well, you know the city of San Dimas isn't going to allow you to build, the proper, uh, build, build a church on that property. We couldn't do it. Uh, but we'll sell it to you for $1.75 million. Boom. And that was a lot of money. And I didn't know what to do. So anyway, what we did do is put our church up for sale, but there was no for sale sign. I'm talking about the building in Lark Ellen and Pueni in West Covina. We, we put it up for sale, but there wasn't any takers. No one seemed to be interested in it at all. Now we come to 1994. We're two years later. In 1994, I'm getting ready to take a group from this church to Israel on a tour. And I have a dream. I don't put much into dreams. But I had a dream that my wife and I were trying to get pregnant. Now, we really weren't. We already had three kids, and that was enough. <laughs> but I had it, we were trying to get pregnant, and we couldn't get pregnant. And so we stepped out to um, adopt a child, and in the process of, of, of trying to adopt a child, she got pregnant. Now, I not had that dream once. I had that dream three nights in a row. And I, and, and I couldn't figure it out. Why am I keep dreaming this same dream three nights in a row? And so I said, Lord, is there some message here in this dream? And what was impressed on my heart is, you step out in faith, you get that property there in San Dimas, and I will sell the property in West Covina. Step out in faith and get that property. Hmm. Now, I'm getting ready to go to Israel. I called Dane Johnson in. I said, Dane, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to Israel. I want you to go and meet with the people at Calvary Chapel Diamond Bar. I want you to get this property in escrow by the time I am back. Don't tell the elders. We don't have time for an elders meeting. We'll put some contingencies in. If they don't like it, that's okay. But we have to get this property in escrow. When I came back, the property was in escrow. Now, here's what you need to know, because this is the exciting thing. Dane met with them on a Monday. On Tuesday, this property was to be sold to Lewis Homes for condominiums and 
Lewis Holmes was offering Calvary Chapel $2.5 million for the property. But Raul Reese and their church over there said to Dane, we will sell this property to you for what we offered it to you back in 1992 for $1.75 million if you agree to buy the property today. Calvary Chapel Diamond Bar saved this church $700,000. Now, this story isn't over with. Dane is one of these odd guys that, that, that likes city council meetings. And so he's watching on TV the, the city council of the, of the city of West Covina. And there was a Korean church that wanted to buy a bowling alley in the city of West Covina and convert it into a church. Dane got a hold of the pastor of that church and said, why do you want a bowling alley when we have a church that we'll offer you right now, and it's located on the corner of Lark Ellen and Puani? And they came over, they looked the facility over, and they paid $1.75 million. <laughs> For that church, this property then was free and clear immediately. God answered the prayer when we stepped out in faith. And, that, and so that's what I think Jeff wants us as a congregation how to did, do. How did your people respond when you went back and told them now, hey, we're going to move from this property over to a place in San Dimas? Were they on board? Yeah, it's a five-mile journey from that church to this church uh, property. What I did was I shared that dream. Mm. And when I shared that dream, 99% of the people voted to move with us. Mm. And that was 1,500 people that was coming to the church at that time. And we were here one year, and we grew 1,000 people in one year, and the budget went up $1 million in one year. Wow. wow. You said 99% of the 99%. People did Dane come over later finally? Yeah, he, he, he was a negative... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he was I always, think we have a photo of Dane back. Did we show that? He's Look always at him there. a drawback. Look at him, Dane, right there in the middle. Wow. Okay. Well, hey, uh, it, it's, we're, we're in our series. One of the things that we've talked about, Ron, is that if we are going to do, God is blessed. I mean, we, we, we know that we're the beneficiaries of a lot of hard work and ministry uh, by you and by Chuck. We know that. Uh, I came seven. Uh, this is my eighth year now. And uh, we have hit the ceiling here a few times. You know, we've, we've gotten to the point, we've tried everything to change times, parking lot issue. Yeah. We've tried it all. But really, the only thing for us that's going to alleviate this and help us go to the next level is that God provide mm -hmm. something, a way for us to be able to expand. And so part of our core value is big faith because we know it doesn't happen you know, when God does it, it it's, it's more often than not, it's not us waiting on God to do something. He's usually waiting on us to make that move. And when he sees that he can trust us and that we're willing to take a big step relying on him, he does amazing things. And I, that's why I wanted to hear your story. Well, Jeff, the thing I want to say, I am so pleased. You know, when you put as many years into this church as I've put mm -hmm. in, from the time I was 10 years of age all the way up to 40, and then after that even, uh, I, I am so proud of this congregation. I'm so proud of the ministry that Jeff is doing. No one wants to see a church die. Mm. And I can tell you there has been two times in the history of this church when it should have died. Mm. And it should not even be in existence today. But uh, because some people had some faith, we pulled through those difficult times. God has blessed this work. Look where things are today. And the future of this church is greater than it's ever been because I know some of the plans that are going to take place. God is going to truly bless this church and Jeff's ministry. And I'm excited. And thank you, Jeff, for allowing me thank to be you, here and you, share Ron. that story. Let's give Ron a big round of applause. Thank you, Ron. Okay, at Etiwana Gardens, down at Sunrise, let's say the big statement again. Here, we're going to put it up on the, uh, the screen, core value. Not only evangelism, but we are people of big faith on the count of three on all campuses. One, two, three. Jesus is our only hope, and we are his plan to reach those far from God. One life at a time. 
There is no plan B. Second statement has to do with big faith. We are not here to maintain, but to take new ground. We honor the past while being faithful to what God is calling us to do in the future. And the reason we do this is because it's one hope, one life in Christ. One hope, one life in Christ. All campuses, one more time. One hope, one life in Christ. God bless you. See you next weekend.